Perfect. Thanks so much, Jessica. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. For uh, folks who are new to this webinar, you're joined here by myself, Allison Kretzinger, our Director of Public Affairs at the agency, and Renee Newkirk, our Chief Financial Officer. The purpose of today's conversation is to, or today's webinar, is to provide you an overview of what was included in the governor's uh, 24 proposed supplemental budget that he submitted to the legislature in late December. As a reminder, his budget is built uh, after agencies submit our decision packages. If you joined us in September, we did a very detailed overview of all the decision packages we submitted. We will go into far less detail today and simply highlight of the DP, of the decision packages and ARL we submitted, what made it into the governor's budget. So that'll be our focus. Um, there's a Q&A function that folks can use to ask questions. We'll answer some of those as we go. We may save some of those to the end and some we may need to get back to you on. Some we just may not be able to answer. Um, and so we'll go from there. But between Renee and I, we'll sort of walk through a little bit of context setting and then dive in. We wanna go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so. This may be familiar to some, new to others. This slide is really how we think about the timeline and the intersection of state agency land. We're one of those at DCYF. Uh, the governor and office of financial management are bosses in authorizing environment, with you, with you, if you will. And then green, the legislature, another authorizing body that we all uh, get to adhere to. Um, but these are the three sort of branches and, and entities that intersect with the process for the agency as well as stakeholders. We'll go through more detailed agency process. Um, we are in January. We are at the fourth day of the legislative session, um, and, and that's where we're at. So the governor submitted his proposed budget in late December, right in advance of the holidays. We've had time to analyze and unpack that, and now the legislature comes to town, Olympia, and contemplates uh, choices for their work. I want to go ahead and go to the next slide. As DCYF builds legislative asks, both funding requests and policy bills, we have a set of guiding principles that really guide our work. These are familiar and are not, should be familiar to those of you who have joined in the past, but we're really focused on uh, reducing racial and ethnic disparities in our outcomes and access to services across the DCYF continuum, prioritizing resources that focus on our core responsibilities as an agency, tethered to our outcomes and strategic plan, as well as provide prioritizing prevention and inter intervention solutions that prevent system penetration, keep children and families from falling deeper into systems of care or our systems, and then looking at programs that have proven practices or research uh, as, as a backing for that. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So our, our process internally for a, for a set of asks begins well in advance of the legislative session. Our deadline, as you saw on the previous slide for submission to any governor's to the governor's office each year is, is in early mid-September. And so our process is iterative and ongoing and formally begins well in advance of the legislature coming to town and well in advance of the governor building his budget. Um, so you can see some of the steps that happen throughout the process uh, with internally and externally with stakeholders, et cetera. I won't go through the details, but I think this is helpful context and grounding. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'll talk through a little bit of the realities and I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague Renee to talk through some of the budget and economic realities, but but this is a supplemental year. So what that means is it is a short session, be it very fast, a short session, 60 days. We uh, in the state of Washington operate on a biennial budget, meaning they come to town, they would have done this last year, they'll do this next year, and contemplate the biennial budget, the budget for the next two fiscal years of state government. Fiscal years start on July 1 and run through June 30 of any given year. So last year, they, they built the biennial budget for fiscal years 24, the fiscal year we're in, that began on July 1, and fiscal year 25, the fiscal year that we, will begin on July 1. So the supplemental year session is really intended to be a year of tweaks, modifications, updates to caseloads, are the revenue updates, more or less revenue coming into the state, do spending adjustments need to be made, et cetera. This is not a moment for innovation and big and bold and new, uh, as our authorizing environment directions tell us. This is really about tweaks and modifications. Um, in addition, another reality that DCYF grapples with is we are implementing significant investment and policy change in every corner of this agency over the last number of years. So that really guides our environment. Um, we've had significant law change and court rulings that have impacted our work in child welfare and JR. And 
we are a system of work done by humans. And so anytime you change an aspect of the law, it is a workforce uh, training opportunity, but also with that comes work and change and change management. And so we really kept that in mind as we built our asks for this session, recognizing we had major initiatives going live this year um, in, in Child Welfare and JR, as well as uh, still implementing Fair Start for Kids Act and other investments in the early learning space. So I note that because I um, it is really important as we build our, our asks for any given year. And then I'll let Renee talk a little bit about the budget and economic realities. And you add all that equation up, it's a limited scope for DCYF and what we were able to put forward, which you saw in our September, September webinar. Thanks, Allison. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just note regarding the budget and economic realities, there was an increase in the forecasted near general fund revenues since the 23-25 biennial budget took effect in July. The forecasted near general fund revenues increased by over $2.9 billion over the four-year outlook period. However, despite the positive trends in revenue growth and other economic factors such as employment, personal income, um, et cetera, caseload costs have gone up for many entitlement programs. This includes public schools, long-term care, medical assistance, foster care and adoption programs, working connections, child care, our juvenile rehabilitation programs, um, as well as other programs across Washington's um, across Washington state that serves our most vulnerable populations. I will note there is a little more than $2 billion rising costs related to providing these ongoing services, these entitlement programs, just due to the caseload, higher caseloads and inflation. So as Allison noted, um, it leaves very little funding for other things. The governor made some sizable priority investments in his budget. He invests um, statewide um, in behavioral health, fentanyl response, housing and homelessness, and climate. Allison captured the supplemental budget very well. So again, I'll just reiterate, this is a more traditional supplemental budget than what we, what we have seen in prior years. In previous years, we've had access to pandemic funding, stimulus funding, that funding is ending. We no longer have access to that. So this truly is a really traditional supplemental budget year. So just wanted to ground us as we move forward in informing you of what the governor's budget um, includes. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So we'll inform you of the investments included in the governor's budget, but as Allison noted, the format of this webinar, we're stepping off of our decision package request. So this spring and summer, as we were compiling our, our budget requests for consideration in the governor's budget, we thought about it in the following categories. So the necessary to impl implement the 23-25 laws, um, supporting core agency needs, maintaining forward progress towards agency goals, and we grouped supporting staff in a separate category as it's well-deserving um, and needs that uh, high priority attention. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide and I'll start diving into investments that the governor makes in his budget. I also wanted to note that uh, the staff safety and supports, this is one that is Secretary Hunter's top priority request when we submitted our budget submission um, in September, this is his top request and it is included in the governor's budget. This item supports the entire agency, acknowledging that the most need is in child welfare, uh, particularly our social workers and our juvenile rehabilitation staff, those in particularly working in community facilities and institutions. With a change in our population, we're serving more children and youth with complex needs in need of mental and behavioral health supports. The number of trauma incidents to our staff is increasing, considering those that we're serving. So this item provides support to our staff in managing not only the, in, the incidental uh, significant trauma, but also just the day-to-day -day crisis um, that's experienced through our work. So the governor's budget funds the mental health professionals um, for our staff and funds uh, program specialists to train and support crisis response and funds uh, staff to support the safety needs. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this one. Stipends for lived experience was the passage of second substitute Senate bill 5793 in the 2022 legislative session that allows for the compensation of lived experiences on boards, commissions, councils, committees, and other similar groups. This was not included in the governor's budget. So I'm not gonna speak any further to this one. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. 
DS implementation. We've received funding in the 23-25 biennial budget. This is the existing budget uh, that we're in right now to implement seven of the eight system improvements as outlined in the DS settlement agreement on behalf of children and youth experiencing placement instability. So the governor's budget funds that last remaining, the seventh um, improvement item, which is family group planning. Um, this is inclusive of the shared planning meetings, the family family team decision making, this contracts for consultation training, program development, monitoring and evaluation, shared planning meeting staff, etc., cetera, um, statewide coaching and mentoring. So the governor's budget funds that. The agreement also requires DCYF to develop new placement settings for children and youth that are experiencing the instability. Therefore, we need the supports for um, to support our rate setting and the payment workload associated with that. So the governor's budget also funds that as well as funding to pay our legal fees. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Emergent placement services. Emergent placement services, this is a short-term placement provided when no other placement is available for children and youth with intensive support needs, otherwise known as EPS. EPS was established by the legislature in 2018. The rate is outdated. We have not received a rate increase since this service was established. Therefore, the governor's budget provides a rate increase to fully cover the cost of this service. Uh, the current rate is $9,267 per month per child, um, and it, the governor's budget funds that at $13,413 per bed per child. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Not going to go over this one in a lot of detail. Um, FRS is a voluntary program serving adolescents and youth in conflict with their families with the goal to reunify and strengthen the family. The request was to transition to a community-based prevention. This is not included in the governor's budget, so I'm not going to go into any further detail regarding this item. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. The basic foster care maintenance payment increase. This increases the basic rate for foster care maintenance payments to licensed caregivers. The rate covers food, clothing, housing, and personal in dentals. The 23-25 budget included a $50 increase to the basic rate. However, that does not fully cover the cost of inflation. So based on a cost analysis, the governor's budget um, increases this rate. Uh, the, the increased rate is birth to five, an increase of $73 per month per child. Age group six to 11, an increase of $254 per month per child. And for ages 12 and up, an increase of $174 per month per child. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this one either. Um, the agency had requested to pay a housing supplement to our EFC population. This is not included in the governor's budget, so i um, not going to go into any further detail on this one. Independent Living Investments. The Independent Living Program is a voluntary program that's designed to teach important life skills to current and former foster youth. The governor funds sustaining the independent living program. This program is funded by a federal grant. However, that grant is allocated to states based on the population, the relative share of children and youth in foster care. So as our caseloads and population is decreasing, our federal funding is also decreasing. So the governor provides backfill funding to sustain this program. The governor also funds sustaining our adolescent transition program managers. The 21-23 budget provided one-time funding for statewide program managers, and uh, that was one-time funding. So the governor provides the funding to continue and sustain those program managers. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. The governor also funds some technology investments, the SSPS replacement system. The SSPS system, it generates invoices to pay our providers, uh, tax reporting, generates letters and notification documents, et cetera. It's a really old, antiquated system. It's reached its useful life. So the governor's budget funds a feasibility study. And once that feasibility study is completed, then we would know what is the resources needed to develop and create a successful SSPS system. So that uh, feasibility study is funded in the governor's budget. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. The governor's budget funds uh, what we refer to as a CWIS. This is a child welfare case management system. CWIS is a comprehensive child welfare information system. It's a case management system, as I noted, for the child welfare program. We had um, 
requested this as a placeholder as our uh, feasibility study was being completed. That feasibility study has been completed, and we do now know the cost uh, to implement a successful case management system in child welfare in the governor's budget fully funds that uh, for the current biennium in fiscal years 24 and 25. All right, so uh, before I turn it over to Allison to walk through investments we received in early learning and juvenile rehabilitation, I'll just pause here for questions. Allison, I'll also note I'm having a slight uh, technology issue and I'm not able to see the, the questions. Uh, so maybe some additional assistance is needed here. Excellent, thanks for flagging that. I will, so far there's only been one question and it was if they would be, if these slides and recording would be posted. So I typed an answer in the chat, they will. If there are other questions that come in, Renee, I'm happy to read them out loud and you and I can sort of tag team answers. So thanks for flagging. Um, so I'm going to walk through investments uh, in the early learning and uh, child, uh, uh, child care space as well as JR, in addition, uh, some of the other investments in the governor's budget. Uh, does the slide indicate, sorry, can we go back two slides to the SSPS? Renee, there's a question. Does the slide indicate the SSPS feasibility study will cost $5.5 million? Yes, it is the feasibility study, and I'll also note there are some, a couple additional costs needed um, in compliance with our OCIO regulations, um, so we can get more information, but it is to implement uh, the feasibility study, so it's all related and tied to the feasibility study. Perfect. All right, we can go back to child care. So we'll go fairly quick uh, through many of these. The governor's budget did not invest in any of the elements uh, included in the Making Child Care Work for Families pot. So we can go to the next slide. Similarly, we did not see investments from the decision package around supporting providers uh, for child care access. I will note, we'll talk about in the other investments, there is some child care contracted slot language tethered to the fentanyl response. So similar to something we proposed here, but slightly different. And so we'll talk about that uh, down the path, if we want to go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we had an ECAP entitlement DP that contemplated rate increases, slots, and quality supports. The governor's budget partially funded the rate increases asked for both in school day and working day at 6 and 10% uh, relatively for school and working day slots. So we see a, a rate increase in the governor's budget for ECAP slots. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The governor's budget did fully fund the coordinated recruitment and enrollment ask that related to the passage of uh, House Bill 1550 concerning transition to kindergarten last session. So we see full funding for the coordinated recruitment and enrollment efforts uh, on the DCYF side there. Go ahead and go to the next slide. We have one piece of agency request legislation related to the monthly count date for early support for infants and toddlers. Um, and so that legislation was approved and funded in the governor's budget. Actually, it was heard on Tuesday because in this short session, there is no rest for the weary and there is no time in the batter's box to warm up. We are just going. Um, we are headed right in. So that bill uh, is, is on its way uh, moving forward and was funded in the governor's budget. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I'll talk a little bit about some of our uh, JR investments. So we have uh, uh, we had some security asks specific to Echo Glen, additional capacity on site for perimeter support and other pieces as the perimeter fence is under construction. That was funded last year in the capital budget. So you see this decision package uh, was funded by the governor um, as we as we mitigate some of the security, the public and focus on public safety and security at Echo Glen. Go ahead and go to the next slide. We also had a decision package requesting resources to stand up a administrative hearings unit inside DCYF related to transfers from JR to DOC for young people who may not yet be 25, but are either wanting to go back or we're recommending uh, would be better served by the DOC system. And so this was a result of a settlement uh, that we were part of and um, was, uh, uh, included in the governor's budget. We're happy to report. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so other investments I indicated will highlight some of the other investments responding. Uh, this slide specifically responds to some of the opioid crisis, the fentanyl crisis. We're pleased to see investments in ideas really generated from uh, stakeholders, the field, uh, and how we continue to support the the safety of families, children remaining with their family, while also grappling with the fentanyl pandemic that many of us are experiencing. 
Um, so we see investment in a public health nurse pilot. Prior to the recession, public health nurses would often accompany uh, social workers in uh, on investigative visits, CPS investigators, um, and it was a, a nice complement uh, to the, the visit. Um, that went away largely, and so asking for some resource to pilot that, bring that back, um, and, and specifically thinking about when we have intakes that are specific to fentanyl, fentanyl use, uh, that public health approach to, to that. Um, so we're excited to see investment there in the governor's budget. We also uh, see investment in what are called third party safety plan participants. So as a young, as a family comes in and through that early stages of a CPS investigation, uh, one of the things we do in all cases is try to put a safety plan in place that will mitigate the safety risk, support the family uh, remaining together and really avoid that, that petition for removal and that dependency process. For some families that come to our attention, they have an engagement with the department. They have robust organic natural supports that can be part of that safety plan. Grandmas, aunties, community members, neighbors, uh, uncles, and, and for some they don't. And so this is really about, is there a way to contract with third-party safety plan consultant participants, adults that can be in the home, additional support for the parent, parents, the child, the children, um, that allow safety, uh, allow the the family to remain together. And so uh, we're we're thrilled to see this. We'll we'll begin testing this. Hopefully, if funded, and um, hopefully, we'll help meet our goals of safely reducing the number of kids in care, keeping families together, et cetera. We also see investment in contracted home visiting slots. So these are home visiting slots by a uh, that we would essentially contract for capacity to be available that our social workers could refer a family who come to the attention again in that investigative phase, um, refer a family into a voluntary <laughs> voluntary home visiting program that can support. Um, and this basically says we'll have space available in that voluntary home visiting program. Uh, so when the referral is made, it, it, the family can begin receiving and benefiting from that service. Similar to that, we see investment in contracted childcare slots for infants. We know one of the best prevention investments our state can make and prevention strategies we have is quality childcare. While parents are, are working on mitigating um, active addiction or treatment or job, job uh, search, um, mitigating their housing needs, having your child in a safe quality space for that early learning is critical. Uh, we often we also know that childcare is especially for infants is hard to find, hard to access, and expensive. And so this pilot would allow us to contract with childcare providers in a couple of select locations to be determined, um, and uh, have available capacity for infants and and have that capacity available. So when a family is engaged with us, comes to our attention, and childcare is identified as a strategy in the safety plan, we can do more than just say childcare should be part of your safety plan call and get it subsidy eligibility, we can say childcare would be an asset to your safety plan, you're eligible for subsidy, and here's a slot available and you can start tomorrow. Um, so that's a, a, those of us who have been parents and had infants, um, a lot of demand. And if you're mitigating your own and struggling with your own active addiction and other challenges, having that space available and available in that moment can be really helpful. And so um, we're excited to see this and we'll we'll continue to support that through the legislative process and optimistic we'll be able to test uh, contracting with child care providers. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Other investments, we see an investment in Rising Strong. Uh, so this is a model, a residential drug treatment model for families. Um, and we'll see, uh, we see investment there to stay, uh, maintain the, the program in the Spokane region, as well as we're continuing to work on expansion onto the west side. We also see some resource in the governor's budget uh, for DCYF related to the TANF time limits for families experiencing financial hardship. This impacts working connection caseload. And so this is the resource necessary to implement a, a DSHS request bill related to, to limits and hardship for families. And then we see investment in the governor's budget that was not a DP because it came late to our attention, uh, but is necessary to replace both the body scanners at Echo Glen and Green Hill to be compliant with new RC uh, with new rules and WAC from DOH related to radiation admissions in body scanners that was part of legislation that passed last year that directed rulemaking. Um, and so we'll need to update our body scanners to ensure they are radiation compliant for, for frequent uh, staff and residents for minors, et cetera. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, some other relevant agency investments. So these are investments that sit in other agencies, but impact our work. We see investment in the State Board of Community and Technical Colleges, about $2 million, $2.4 million 
for scholarships and funding for the state board to continue to recruit, advise, and support uh, child care providers working on attaining their education and their, their certificate credentials through the state board system. So scholarship staff to support that advising and, and be partnered with the learners and the scholars that go through the community college system. We also see funding in the healthcare authority budget for the bridge program, which is an innovative approach to supporting young adults who are discharging from behavioral health facilities. So some intersection potentially an overlap with our systems. And then we see um, a contract, a construction training study to evaluate construction related training programs at correctional facilities and provide recommendations to strengthen these. And we certainly wanna be part of that as we think about our uh, JR population having access to that. So uh, excited to see these investments in other agencies that will impact our clients and the work we do at DCYF. In record time, 27 minutes, Renee and I have gone through the totality of our slides. There is a question, what happened for childcare? We quickly reviewed the childcare decision packages. There were two decision packages we submitted related to family support and provider support. Uh, the governor's budget did not invest in those decision packages, um, uh, but did invest in scholarships, did invest in contracted slots specific for infants in the in the fentanyl response space, as well as uh, the ECAP rate increase, the partial week ECAP rate in case increase, and coordinated recruitment and enrollment, which will support providers in that space as well. Um, so we'll pause there and see if there are other questions that folks have. We'll give it a few minutes, none coming in yet, but feel free to use the Q&A. Uh, question about the basic foster care rate. So I'll punt to Renee on this one. Are the increases in the basic foster care rate on top of the new level system that went into effect July 1 or January 1? Great question. It is in addition to the $50 increase that's already included in this current enacted budget. There's there's no impact to the, to the one to seven level system. It's, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, so it's there's there's the basic rate and then there's the levels. So it is, um, there's no impact to that, but there is an increase, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, the basic rate will increase. The level amount, about $250 at each level, stays the same, but your but your base will increase if enacted by the legislature. Right. Great question. Hang out for a few more minutes and see if there's other questions that come in. What were the bill numbers you mentioned? Um, we have agency request legislation related to the early supports for infants and toddlers. That is House Bill 1916, I believe. Pretty sure that's the bill. Uh, that's our agency request legislation bill. There are thousands of other bills <laughs> floating around, hundreds that in fact DCYF and our clients that we're analyzing. Um, but that's the 1916 is the early support for infants and toddlers agency request bill. What about the details about reunification services that were not funded? I think you're talking about the family reunification services decision package, the FRS DP to move to community base that was not funded in the governor's budgets. And just as a reminder for folks, after the governor's budget comes out, executive branch agencies, that's us, uh, that becomes our script. That's what we're working on. Um, and so we want to be transparent about the, the sequence and the process and what we put forward and what was funded at this point as we sort of engage, as we engage with the legislature uh, as an agency, uh, we are talking about things that were funded in the governor's budget, supporting those, continuing to make progress and advocating for those. And we will largely remain silent um, on the other pieces. We certainly can answer questions and provide technical assistance and feedback, um, but we are, uh, we are, are, are not engaging in proactive work on the other elements. Those are the rules of the game. Give it a few more minutes and see if there's any other questions that trickle in. And as folks are uh, sort of choosing to hop off as we've sort of concluded, thank you all so much for coming. I'll just note, um, appreciate your interest and engagement and, and do feel free to reach out if there are additional questions.
Did you also mention Senate Bill 2793? I did not. And off the top of my head, I don't know what that is, but I will see what that is. 2793 is not a bill number that is found. So I'm not sure if that's a typo, but I don't see that bill number being one that's recorded. What was budgeted for childcare working connections? There were no adjustments to working connections uh, in the budget other than maintenance level caseload adjustments, which Renee spoke to as sort of the general approach to caseload adjustments. There were no additional investments in working connections this year, either in eligibility changes or rates included in the governor's budget. Correction, 5793, perfect. Let me see what that is. I, the title of that bill is called Concerning Paid Sick Leave. I don't have any information about that bill. So that's not one that, that we mentioned. I think maybe um, there was mention of a bill number from last year. That was a bill that passed last year related to stipends for lived experience that has similar numbers, but not in that order. <laughs> But I can't remember that. That might be 5397 or 5379. Uh, that was a bill that passed in the 23 legislative session um, that we had a DP that corresponded with that also was uh, not funded in the governor's budget. These slides will be posted as well. So that information will be um, available on those slides. Not seeing any more questions come in. Appreciate again, everyone joining. Thanks so much. I hope folks have a wonderful Thursday and a happy weekend and stay away from the blizzards. I don't know, we're supposed to get snow over here. We don't know what to do. Excellent. All right, thanks everyone.